Although we were gifted with this incredible technology, the human body, with which we could make incredible diagnoses, um, and we had a, had a particular procedure to do that, things were changing for us. So, so the old way was to make an assessment about somebody as they walk through the door, prejudge them. We knew exactly, pretty much, the spectrum of maladies that they would possess before they even presented themselves. Then when they sat down in front of you, you would examine them, cross-examine them as if you were some kind of judge. And then you would get to use these fine instruments here and palpate to feel the textures of the bodies to try and make semiotic diagnoses completely through your fingertips. But things were changing and I was kind of confused because we had a standard through which we would meet our expectations, our own expectations of what you should be. We had a standard, we called it the Grey's Anatomy. It was kept in large tomes in a large book that we would leaf through and examine anatomical exactitude, after which there were only deviations. And then when genetics came along, there were mutations. So we were pretty convinced that we understood the configuration of the body to a point where it was a doctrine. And then when the big machines came and they could see the inner cavities of the body, big washing machine types and sized tunnels which we inserted people into and could actually see as if we'd skipped to the end of the book what the answer was without even touching a patient. We were now starting to look at the human body from the inside out in black and white. And I had no idea what that meant. And although I know that I knew that medical secretaries had these little Amstrad screens that were parked on the end of medical reception areas, um, I'd really never come across a computer or really ever used one. And I knew that this was really important and I needed to know more. So when I turned up at Virtual Futures 1995, I should have known better, even by the, the, the appearance of the, of the poster, that the unexpected was just about to happen to me. But belligerently, I pursued my rather mechanical materialism, expecting some kind of technology that would give me a magical solution to knowing everything that there was to know about the human body. And I was challenged on every single front because it wasn't my understanding of machines or technology that was at stake. What was, ext what was at stake for me when I turned up in a philosophy conference was the way that I thought about things. And that completely shattered the way that I saw the world. And I went on a journey of rediscovery. So the next year, I came back. I came back this time to present with my own video, and I'm going to show it to you. I'll just tell you a little bit about it, and then I'll stop talking. I was a medical student um, and had a sabbatical at um, Pune. Uh, it was a, a, a leprosy hospital where I treated patients um, that had lost parts of their limbs. They'd lost parts of their faces, and they lived an independent existence by using the most primitive prostheses and technologies to restore their bodies as a whole and live a functional life in communities that were productive, that could, could farm, and they could um, actually make industrial components with machines that had readjusted mechanical advantages. It was an amazing place. And it really led me to think, I mean, why? why? Why was there such a stigma about the difference of these bodies? And this video was really edited. It was 1992. I re-edited this video after um, being at this um, leprosy hospital. And it's a combination of images that I saw of people living a functional community life. And then as the video goes on, you start seeing those that are excluded by disease, by stigmata of illness, and particularly the stigmata of leprosy. And I'll tell you what they are. They're the, they're the charco fractures, the loss of fingers and um, toes. Um, and often they get infected and the hands and feet crumble away. Um, and the other one is very classical facial um, uh, uh, destruction, which... Um, uh, results in loss of cartilage. The bacterium eats the cartilage of the face. So you get loss of the soft palate and the, and the nose. And um, I'll just, just play the, the video now.
look like an ape monkey they look like an ape monkey they look like an ape monkey He says his original nose is also not like this. <laughs> so that was the objective voice of medicine there. Um, so one of the things that I came across at Virtual Futures was Donna Haraway. And the idea that you could now have a, a, a melange of little machines that could effectively constitute the body made a lot of sense. Um, and, and this idea then that we could, we could rebuild bodies as if they were machines seemed a very attractive one. And particularly as the advent of genetics was happening and we were starting to sequence the human genome, the possibility of actually literally taking life into our own hands and rebuilding it, shaping it as we wanted it to, seemed very much at, 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 you know, a, a possibility. Um, and... The reason I'm showing this particular picture is not because it's actually uh, genes. These are actually Eve Klein's um, blue body prints of, of, of women that have laid naked on a canvas. And I really want to start to talk about slippage here. Because my response to how we may possibly build the body again, now that we have this potential space in which we can reimagine the virtual world that can deal with the insides as well as the outsides, which is what photography couldn't do, um, was then to imagine how we could actually create these machines and, and reconfigure them. So I wrote a, a, a book really in, as, a, as a thought experiment in, in, in examining what this could possibly be. And I ended up with aliens, okay? body parts everywhere, all kinds of different ways of thinking about the body as machine, incorporating all kinds of different parts from all kinds of different places, animals, plants, cryonically rejuvenated zombies um, and uh, it was an interesting thought experiment but being a medical practitioner I am an experimentalist and I want to know how to build things and so having been to this um, set of conferences I really started to frame my own questions again I didn't think I was asking the right question so it wasn't how do I build a body out of this assemblage of parts it was really more to do with the function of, of the body. What is it that bodies do that machines don't? Is, is there an, another solution space, really, that gives us the creative potential to really explore um, the, 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 the human body in a way that, is, that, that does things that we know bodies do, but we really can't explain them using mechanical rhetoric? And one person who isn't here today, um, who I really wished was here and I met um, in 95, is um, Neil Spiller, who's um, dean at the, uh, at the School of Architecture in Greenwich. Um, and essentially, he came here as a way of critiquing um, um, architecture uh, through the digital medium. And he, he, he was asking very interesting questions that I started to apply to questions that we might ask about the body. So here, can we create architectures, so I read the body, that slip into other locations and spaces and return to show us what they've found and plant a notation of this event in our environment, producing a sublimity of space that grows and decays changes and rearranges that speaks of the human condition as the actor in a series of linear, non-linear and quantum events. Beautiful, poetic, can we build it? And if we can, what does it look like? Well, Spiller's drawings are actually very interesting. He is a, a surrealist um, and this is one picture from a series of drawings that are called Communicating Vessels, which really articulates relationships between surreal objects, which are actually also architectures, um, that inhabit an island off the coast of Kent. Um, and their engagement in interactions with each other are the subject for Spiller's narratives and drawings. So here we actually have re-articulating architectures being depicted around the, uh, the flight of a pathway of a, of a bumblebee here. 
And now that just might seem quite ridiculous and not very useful until you start looking at the current developments in complexity science and information technology, where we're starting to use complexity as a framework for examining the world. So where would the body sit within a complex framework? Because let's face it, a complex map is not very useful. It is telling us something about uh, the way that we see the world, that it is complex, that we can find connections between lots of different systems in lots of different ways, but we can't use it to predict the future, and nor can we use it to deduce what happened before that fragment of, of, of time. So complexity is a very interesting um, science that's emerging. And I think that really we're just at the very beginnings of finding the tools, the methods, the technologies that can help us properly investigate that space. Because I think that technologies um, uh, of, of complexity exist outside of cyberspace as well. So while cyberspace is host to a graphical um, investigation of, of um, complexity, um, the, the embodiment of that complexity then from cyberspace into the real world becomes quite problematic. And so we have to use printing techniques. And even though we can print cells now on bioscaffoldings, even though we have um, protein-based um, you know, biosensors, we're really not getting the level of complexity that, that life uses. So my question then became, if, if life isn't just a little series of machines, and I, I went back to the idea that the human body is made of cells, I can't, I'm not going to look at the whole body, um, I'm actually going to look at the, the, the components, the units. What is the unit that the, the body um, moves around? And of course, in science, we have a way of finding this stuff out. We don't just talk about it. Uh, we go ahead and we build it. Um, and so that has been my pursuit for the last three years. Um, and rather than trying to make a preformed body um, out that, that, that is conceived as, as being a machine with a very specific set of uh, functions, designs, and outcomes, um, I decided to take a completely different approach. And some of you will have seen this, um, this video before, but I went about trying to simulate living systems in a way that took a different um, view of, of how we produce life. So essentially all I did was I used a technology that had been invented in 1898 by Otto Buchli, um, uh, an experimentalist who added potash to um, a, a, an oil and observed what he called amoeboid-like reactions. Um, and I, I work at the um, Southern University of Denmark with uh, Martin Hanzik, who's a professor of chemistry there. And he's been designing a technology, which is really a programmable do droplet, um, that we can use to distribute um, material in time and space. And these are called protocells. So what you're looking at is self-assembling um, droplets um, in, a, in, a, in a medium that are able to grow microstructures. These are actually very big. These are on the scale of millimeters. They're, they're at least 100 times bigger than an ordinary cell. Um, and you can see that you know, we've even got recognizable biological um, analogies. You know, so we've got the, the spiral structures. We've also got um, uh, protocells that can, can fuse. Now, this is a very interesting clip here because you can see that this protocell, without any DNA, so it is literally made of oil, sodium hydroxide, and some olive oil. So without any DNA, it is able to evolve in its own medium, a medium which is really a, a homogenous field. There's nothing in that field other than the, um, the, the protocell itself. So the protocell is intrinsically linked to its environment and ultimately sensitive to it because its active interface is not on the interior like biological cells, but on the exterior. Um, and what it does is it uses chemical energy on the outside where the, it interfaces between the oil and the water. And here it's making a product which is becoming a, a physical um, uh, formation of, of um, crystals um, that starts to exert secondary physical forces on the droplets. So you've now seen it going from a free-swimming droplet to something that is now starting to crawl like a worm, and that has taken under a minute to achieve that. So this then raises questions. 
You know, if, if it didn't need a genetic point mutation or some kind of uh, mutational event to create not only a change in shape but also change in movement in something that really doesn't count as being alive, then what is life and what are the fundamental units through which we examine the composition of our bodies and in life in general. You can also see that in this system, these droplets are incredibly social. They seem to like each other. I know I'm anthropomorphizing wildly. I'm not ashamed of that because there's no other way to get so excited about what a simple set of chemicals, which is no more complex than the average salad dressing contains, and can achieve. And this is my favourite movie of all time. I must, I must not scream halfway through this, this movie. And um, What you've got is you've got a home team, which is a, a population of interacting protocells that like each other. They're all doing the same thing. They're all creating the same kind of structures. They meet the away team, who check them out, and there's some kind of interaction. And the next thing that happens... <sighs> what the hell was that? There is no programming in that. There is no instruction. That was an emergent behavior of some description. It's not, it's not just been seen once. I've managed to capture it on the, in, in movies quite a few times. I'm having trouble trying to induce it and, and, and replicate it at will, but I know it's possible. So I think it's got something to do with positive and negative feedback cycles that are happening as the protocell is creating a metabolism and transforming its own environment. And this is the beauty of the model of this system, that necessarily life is depending on its relationship with the environment. And we've heard during the day about this, this um, duality between kind of an interior existence and this external relationship where um, organisms are shaping their environment. So um, um, uh, Richard Lewontin would say that organisms and their environment co-evolve. And I think that the protocells are very much um, um, a, a demonstration, not just a graphic transitory um, visualization, but they actually embody a dynamic process that can reach these slippages. It can, it can move out of a, of a chemical droplet state and, and turn into an embodied crystalline state, which sometimes has real biological homologies. Um, and so these are my protocell roses. And it's not the first time that this, this homology between chemical and biological systems systems has been observed. It's been observed for a long time over the um, over the course of the last century. But once we got excited about genetics in, you know, in the late 50s, um, we forgot all about um, many of these emergent systems. But now we're starting to get excited about them again as we're trying to um, uh, create artificial life forms. Um, and so the, the importance of having a technology that's intrinsically embedded in and, and sensitive to its changing environment is, is literally because we are facing an environmental crisis. The fact that machines are belligerent to their environment, they don't have the, the immersive sensitivity to the environment, means that they really don't detect changes, subtle changes, subtle nuances in, in where they're existing. And these are just a series of photos taken on a, on a canal side in Venice, which really shows the way that these um, biological structures, which are in the foreground and dark, which have been created by oysters and algae and bacteria, um, are, are able to be resilient in the um, face of, of changing um, uh, current in the water and um, you know, the, the amount of um, you know, movement in the environment. Um, so what can I do with that? Um, so I've been working with um, uh, an architect called Philip Beasley. Uh, we decided that we were going to um, scale up um, the, the whole of these processes and create a, an experience that was um, a, a synthetic life form. So this is Hylozoic Ground. It was exhibited at the Venice Biennale. It's based on um, Beasley's work with um, Rob Gorbe, which was to create a responsive jungle-like matrix, a feathery matrix. It maximizes its surface area rather than minimizes it like modernism does into geometries. Um, and it's a very effusive um, environment. It's um, sensitive to um, changes in the um, airflow. It responds by twittering and shivering and, and, and squeaking like a, a, a cricket. Um, it has giant swallowing tubes and hairy tongues that reach up and tickle 
the people that move through the gallery space. And within this space, we decided to create a different kind of interactive technology that responded on a different time scale, but yet was connected to these cybernetic fronds of the hylozoic ground. And we place them in these um, open vials. Um, we can really think of them as being fruits within the jungle. Or actually, uh, the way I'd, I'd, I'd rather prefer to frame them is, this is a giant sinus. It's got hairy things dripping out of the sinus, these little fronds. And within it, we've got these, these sensory um, uh, vials full of mucus. And this mucus can actually smell you. It can detect um, carbon dioxide in the surrounding environment and turn it into colour. So if we think of these primitive sensations that um, life are equipped with, which is an embodied um, integral part of the, of, of the life agency, then we can actually think of these, um, these vials as being organs that are able to perceive olfactory and gustatory information. So the, 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 the carbon dioxide in particular that you give off then creates a chemical change within the, um, the protocells, which are then able to secrete um, materials in response to that. So you can see the hylozoic ground smelling. Um, and, I mean, again, these are not small. I engineered the protocells, so they're about another 10 times the size again. So I could actually get these cells almost as big as the, the first joint of your thumb. Um, and, and so, really, we're, we're, we're creating a, a, um, a, a sculptural response to the, um, the, the, the gases that um, both the um, Venetian air and the respiratory gases given off by the individuals are, um, are producing. Um, and of course, over time, there's a, there's a further transformation. I, I think of this as being very much like an embryological um, form of architecture. You get the soft, organic, um, effusive membrane, and on top of that, then you get hardened crystallization. So literally, we're turning cartilage into bone. We're getting the beginnings of mineralization at this level. And we can see that each, each of these um, uh, droplets are starting to process information from the environment and turn it into a, a, a protocell body. And so with, with Neil Spiller, we, we've been articulating, this is the beginning of a journey, we've started to articulate um, exactly what this, this protocell technology um, could, could mean for design, for engineering, um, for, for, for the meaning of life, really. Um, and um, one of the um, architects who's contributed to the, um, uh, to, to the, to the issue of, of, of AD, um, you, you, you're, you're already recognize his artwork. He doesn't know I'm showing you this bit. Um, but um, it's, it's Dan Slavinsky, so he's in the audience, and he made the Virtual Futures um, amazing posters. Um, and I just really want to um, finish by just note to self, really. Um, when you think you know something about something, when, like, you're a medical student and that you're told all this information that you're empowered with, uh, through which you are, you're, you're going to do something to the world with, I would just say think again, because sometimes those assuredness, um, those, those assurances are as much an obstacle to your engagement with the world as they are a vehicle through which you can navigate it. So thank you. <laughs>